Welcome to Friday's edition of COVID-19. We're ending the work week with a slight decline in the daily cases and greater hopes for protection against the pandemic as public vaccinations continue. Meanwhile, Korea has been invited to the Group of Seven Summit, which is poised to kick off on Friday over in the UK. We have more later on in the program. Here first is a broader pandemic coverage. Now, Soa, start us off then for this uh, Friday. All right, Sunny, we are heading into the weekend with a decline in COVID-19 infections as 556 cases were reported as of 12 a.m. this Friday. And with that, the number of domestic transmissions has dropped to below the mid-500s. In the past week, we are seeing infections hovering between the 400s and the 700s. And the total number of cases here in the country stands at 146,859. And if we take a closer look, the Capital Seoul has reported again over 200 cases, more than 170 in Gyeonggi-do province. And Gyeongsangnam-do province has hit the 5,000 mark this Friday with 20 new infections. And uh, while there are some positive trends that have emerged recently, including a declining fatality rate attributed to the vaccination among seniors, the government this Friday, however, decided to keep the social distancing measures at the current level for three more weeks, beginning on Monday. That means level two in the capital region and level 1.5 in other parts of the country and also the ban on private gatherings of five or more people. Preparations, however, are in full swing for a new social distancing scheme to be launched in July. The pilot run for a revised social distancing system that's in effect in Jeollanam-do province, Gyeongsangbuk-do province and Gyeongsangnam-do province will be extended to Gangwon-do province. We will first begin easing restrictions on low-risk cultural activities such as sports games and arts performances by raising attendance caps in stages. Now measures will be relaxed when at least 13 million people of the nation's population receive at least one jab of COVID-19 vaccination. And as of 12 a.m. this Friday, that figure stands at over 10.5 million. And meanwhile, the G7 group of nations are expected to reveal a plan to donate 1 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccination to poorer countries with an aim to inoculate the entire world by the end of next year. Let's also take a quick look at some global figures. We are seeing in India and Brazil around 90,000 new infections in the past day and Iran meanwhile has hit the 3 million mark when it comes to total accumulated cases. And the number of COVID-19 infections around the world stands at 175.6 million. Those are the updates I have for now. I'll see you back after the government briefing. Sunny. All right, so thank you for now. Meanwhile, back on the local vaccination campaign, we have marked a milestone on that front earlier on Thursday. And I have Kim sung yeon here in the studio with details on that feat. Welcome, sung yeon Hello, good afternoon. Right, so Korea has offered at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine to over 10 million people. Right, so we have passed the 10 million mark, and this is as of uh, 12 a.m. on Friday. A total of 10.56 million people have received their first doses, accounting for over 20% of the country's entire our population. Now, 2.63 million people, or around 5% of the population, have been fully vaccinated. Health authorities have set a goal of inoculating 14 million people by the end of this month and 36 million by September. The KDCA chief expressed her optimism that more vaccinations could help Korea bring down the number of infections. We're expecting a steeper decline in the daily caseloads after mid-July when we have inoculated more than a quarter of our population, provided that we continue to maintain our prevention efforts. The country is hoping to achieve herd immunity earlier than its original timeline of November as vaccinations pick up pace. The government also plans to offer more incentives to vaccinated people to boost its inoculation campaign. It is working to allow fully vaccinated citizens to travel overseas in groups as early as in July. 
Right, and Sonia, inoculations using Janssen vaccines also kicked off on Thursday, I believe. That's right. Uh, so Thursday was indeed day one, as you said, uh, where the country began administering Janssen vaccines supplied by the U.S. government uh, for those in the military, including reserve forces, civil defense personnel, as well as others. Now, more than a quarter million people received the Janssen single-dose vaccine on day one, and those who got their shots on Thursday appeared to be happy and relieved. I had to wait a while, but I feel relieved that I've gotten my shot. Of the over 1 million doses received from the U.S., roughly 90 percent of them are being given to those between the ages of 30 and 60, working in national defense or foreign affairs. Health authorities first started taking reservations on June 1st for 900,000 doses, and all of them were fully booked in just 18 hours. The other 110,000 doses are being kept in reserve for people who have to leave the country quickly for important public functions or business affairs, and residents living in the country's most remote regions. All right, Songyun, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Thank you for having me. Right, now, as Songyun just mentioned, inoculations using, uh, against COVID-19 using Janssen vaccines by courtesy of the U.S. are underway here in the country for military-related personnel. Our Chon song is out on location now to share with us some scenes from that firsthand. Hello, song Hello, song -cho. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, so Songjo, which center are you at? Well, I'm at Myeongji Hospital in Western Seoul, where the first batch of Johnson & Johnson's Janssen vaccine is being administered to people. Now, this vaccine is the fourth COVID-19 vaccine product to be imported to South Korea uh, after AstraZeneca's, Moderna's, and Pfizer's. Shipments arrived here in South Korea on June 5th, and vaccination uh, started just yesterday for 900,000 special forces, reserve forces and civil defense members and those who uh, those in charge of defense and foreign affairs who are aged over 30. Now uh, let's look around this center a little bit more. Um, and those people who were able to get the reservation are considered the lucky ones because the competition was really fierce in South Korea indeed. I mean, the reservation spots quickly filled up and fully booked just within 18 hours on the first day when it first opened. Now, the South Korean government has set a goal of vaccinating 25 percent of its people uh, during the first half of this year, and that's about 13 million people until the end of this month. And uh, when I check the data, uh, the government data, well, just as of about uh, midnight last night, around 20.6% of South Korea's total population were vaccinated with the first shot. So looking at the current pace, I think South Korea is well on its path of reaching that goal. Now, uh, let's talk to a medical professor who's been administering shots into people's arms all throughout the year, this year, basically. Um, and let's have him on the show. Good afternoon. Uh -huh. All right, so I'm going to ask him about some of the most frequent questions about the Janssen vaccine. Um, so can you break down uh, about what you know about the Janssen vaccine and how effective it is? Uh, the Janssen, Janssen vaccine is the, using the human adenovirus vector, and the strength of the, this vaccine is... Uh, uh, very good. The, the, very good, and the, 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 because the, it can be stored at the temperature of the 2 to 8 degrees wow. Celsius. And the, 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 the um, characteristics of this vaccine is the, the single dose schedule. So the, it is very effective to the one dose shot. Right, right. And the, also it is uh, uh, very highly preventive to the South Africa variant. So it doesn't need ultra cold chain. Uh, it, you can only get one shot, and it's highly effective against the South African new yeah, mutant uh, virus. All right, so what are the possible symptoms of Janssen vaccine, and what should people be aware of? The aware of the, this Janssen vaccine, the side effect, we worry about the thrombosis. Mm -hmm. This is a very rare side effect. The, the thrombosis is the most the, developed in the most of the women, and the, but it, it can be treated if we 
detected earlier, if you uh, experience the severe headache, abdomen pain, and the shortness of breath, please visit the doctor. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the side effects that the professor has just mentioned uh, can happen for the first couple of days, and they should just go away uh, just after a couple of days. But you should remember that they are normal signs that your body is building protection. But if those symptoms get more severe and last longer than that, then you should contact your health care provider. This has been Jeon Sung Cho reporting live and back to you in the studio. All right, Sung Cho, as always, thank you very much for the report. Now, we are now poised to join the regular briefing on COVID-19 here in Korea for this Friday. Moreover, as of today midnight, uh, today we have about, uh, the, as for the inoculations, we also are proceeding with that. And we also have more than 333,000 people receiving their first dose. Um, my apologies, uh, let me repeat myself and my, my, make myself more clear. And yesterday alone, we have administered the uh, vaccine to about 1 million people. And as for the first dose recipients, we have 733,000 people and about 285,000 people who received their second dose. And also in accumulation, we also have more than 10,565,000 people receiving their first dose and about two a million people receiving their second dose as well. And as of yesterday, we also have the Janssen vaccines being rolled out, and about 27.2% of the eligible recipients of the Janssen vaccines have completed their vaccination. And as for the hospitals that are giving out these Janssen vaccines, as for the surplus vaccines, uh, we are also providing these surplus vaccines to the people who have signed up for the Jan uh, AstraZeneca vaccines, given that they have uh, given given their consent. And also as for the uh, senior citizens who have received the Janssen vaccines, uh, we have about 5,000 people. Uh, and among them, we have about uh, 3,000 people who have received the Janssen vaccines uh, by uh, cancelling their uh, sign-up for the AstraZeneca vaccines. And moreover, as for the treatments, um, the remdesivir, we have administered the drug to uh, more than 7,800 7, people here in the country across 126 hospitals, and the Reconora treatment have been administered to more than 4,500 patients here across the country. And as for pl a blood plasma treatment, aside from the clinical uh, trials, we have a total of 47 uh, cases that have been approved by our uh, Ministry of Drug, Food and Drug Safety and are also being administered right now. Moreover, the Public Infectious Disease Research Institute, uh, as for starting from the June, uh, we will be operating three new drug assessment labs for these um, virus uh, treatments. And we believe that these labs will also uh, be very helpful and effective in developing uh, further drugs and vaccines for uh, many infectious diseases. And going forward, we have more uh, increased demand from the private and public sector to uh, uh, establish such uh, data, data labs, and therefore we agreed to uh, do so for three, and they are all under the BSL-3 grade, and we will be uh, doing uh, an in-depth analysis, and also we will be setting up new criteria and standards uh, use it, utilizing these labs. And through such drug assessment uh, labs, we will be able to provide the substances that are needed uh, to uh, develop the treatments for many infectious diseases, including uh, the COVID-19. And we believe that we can expand it, these development platforms going forward. Moreover, as for the COVID-19 drug and also vaccination um, development, uh, our task force has met once again yesterday, and we agreed to also uh, de uh, detailed discussions on about 11 tools, including the oxygen providers and also uh, 
uh, detailed uh, diagnostic kits. Uh, we have discussed our uh, detailed information about these 11 uh, equipment and tools. And going forward, we will also provide uh, pan-government support as for the, any uh, areas that are needing help. And moreover, the vaccines that we are administering to the public right now is uh, probably it will act as uh, prevention uh, measures going forward. And we all heard of the breakthrough cases, which means uh, that people getting infected with the virus even after a vaccination. So this means that uh, even after you are inoculated fully, uh, there are uh, chances of you getting uh, the virus. However, uh, as for COVID-19, uh, this rate is very low. And as for South Korea, which has a very low, uh, relatively low uh, infection rate, we also have much lower uh, cases and uh, um, possibility of such breakthrough cases. And compared to uh, the um, pre-inoculation uh, levels, uh, you will also develop uh, less symptoms, uh, less severity in the symptoms, and this means that there are uh, benefits that outweigh the risks of uh, getting inoculations. And we mentioned this multiple times, however, uh, considering the fact that these COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccines have been administered globally, uh, and uh, more than 200 uh, mil, uh, billion doses have been uh, administered globally, and we believe uh, that uh, getting yourself vaccinated is the best measure to protect yourself as well as your loved ones against the virus. And the government right now in Korea aim, aims to uh, reach herd immunity by November, and we are also picking up speed as when it comes to the inoculation right now. Uh, right now, uh, South Korea has been uh, one of the latecomers um, in terms of uh, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. However, we are one of the 25 countries when it comes to the vaccination speed right now. And uh, if we are able to keep our uh, contain the uh, uh, infectious rate very low, we believe that we can contain the virus going forward. And as for our end, the measures, we are taking a step closer to reaching um, vaccine, um, vaccine sovereignty. And this vaccine sovereignty means uh, keep having three capabilities. First, it is all about having the technology to develop and also uh, manufacture vaccines. And second, uh, it is al al also about confirming uh, the effectiveness of the vaccines through clinical trials. And third, it is all about uh, securing raw materials to enable the mass production of vaccines and to having the capacity to inoculate uh, the people in a timely manner. So we believe that these three aspects are the essential keys to uh, vaccine sovereignty. Among them, we already have some aspects that have been reached, and right now we are uh, in the process of uh, achieving, and also we are exerting our efforts in order to reach these goals. And thanks to the public efforts and participation in uh, the uh, inoculation rollouts, we believe that these uh, vaccine sovereignty will enable us to have also uh, to uh, take the path towards to a safer future uh, going forward, even after combating the COVID-19. We will also exert our full efforts. Right, that was Kwon Junuk with Friday's afternoon briefing. So what did he have to say? Well, it was all about uh, the vaccination program here in Korea. Uh, Kwon mentioned that uh, we should remember that uh, there are more benefits of getting vaccinated than risks. Uh, as he was mentioning, some breakthrough cases that can happen with any vaccination product. However, that's very rare and especially here in Korea. And with that, he again expressed hopes for herd immunity to be achieved by November. And also, uh, there are more drugs assessment uh, labs being expand, expanded for virus treatment and uh, the official also mentioned that Korea although has been earlier uh, been named as a latecomer when it comes to vaccination uh, in uh, compared to other countries but now it is the 25th country when it comes to the speed in vaccination and he also uh, highlighted that we are inching closer to vaccine sovereignty right well that is encouraging to know all right so I thank you very much for that thank you Right, up next, efforts are in the works to offer some relief to the local travel industry amid the pandemic as our vaccination campaign, as Soa mentioned, gains momentum. We have details in this report. The global tourism industry is showing signs of new life 
after a year lost to the COVID-19 pandemic. With vaccination efforts picking up steam across the world, many countries are starting to reopen their once sealed borders. Many travel agencies here in Korea have rolled out new tour packages aimed at fully vaccinated people who are looking to travel abroad. The effects of COVID-19 on the travel industry has been catastrophic, as international travel was completely suspended overnight. Major travel agencies have seen their revenues tumble by around 80 percent, compared to pre-pandemic levels. However, the rollout of vaccines across the globe has provided a much-needed lifeline for the beleaguered tourism industry. The government is also offering new vaccine incentives, not requiring those who have been fully vaccinated for two weeks or more to undergo quarantine after flying in from overseas. The government will also allow fully vaccinated people to travel in groups starting in July. Travel agencies are now starting to offer tour packages to destinations like the Maldives and Switzerland, which have adopted similar quarantine exemption policies. The tourism industry staff to the very forefront of the vaccine queue. So now we have got a 97% of the tourism industry staff has got their first dose and 67% has got their second dose. So the tourism industry is very much vaccinated. So we look forward to welcoming uh, Korean tourists very soon. However, travel agencies are also taking extra precautions to keep their clients safe from COVID-19. So what more can be done to ensure that people can travel freely across borders without worry of being infected? 사실 코로나 시대에는 적어도 관광업계에 있어서는 백신이 절대적인 영향력을 가지고 있다고 볼 수가 있습니다. 백신 접종을 해야지 여행자들도 여행이 가능해지고요. 또 접종률이 높아져야 해외 여행자들로부터 여행 목적지로 선택을 받을 수가 있습니다. 여행업계에 또한 모든 서비스 접점이나 의사결정에 있어서 안전을 최우선 순위를 두고 전통적인 어떤 상품 기획이나 운영 방식에서 벗어나서 개인화되고 맞춤화된 여행 상품을 제시해야 할 것입니다. The continued rollout of vaccines may allow international travel to further reopen as we head into the second half of the year. G7정상회의에서 문 대통령은 6월 12일과 13일 양일에 걸쳐 개최되는 확대회의 세계 세션에 참석하여 그린과 디지털을 주축으로 하는 한국판 뉴딜의 경험을 공유할 예정입니다. 
Members of the group of seven nations, as well as President Moon Jae-in and his counterparts from Australia, India and South Africa, are poised to join talks over in the UK this weekend. For more on their agenda and Korea's potential role in this wider alliance, I have visiting Professor Ahn Jun Sung from Yonsei University. Welcome back, Professor Ahn. Uh, thank you. Also joining this session virtually is Professor John Kirkin at the University of Toronto, who is also the director and co-founder of the G7 Research Group. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Professor Curtin. Great to be with you. Right then, Professor Ann, the G7 summit was cancelled last year given the pandemic, but vaccinations this year have offered members the chance to meet in person. What do you believe is the diplomatic significance of the summit this time around? Yeah, I think that there are two different perspectives. From, first, from the G7 perspective, it is the first time uh, for the leaders of a developed country to get together in a, in a single place. It means that they will have a face-to-face -face summit meetings in order to discuss the global issues such as the you know, you know, vaccine distribution and then climate change. And uh, second, from Korean perspective, uh, it will be a great opportunity to play a bigger role in the international community you know, so that you know, that means that you have to prepare for more for that, you know, you know, you know work, right? Right. Professor Curtin, some observers believe the summit this year offers the West a final chance to reassert its leadership role in global affairs. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's an understandable judgment for uh, two reasons. The first, of course, is that uh, last year when President Donald Trump uh, was the chair of the G7, he chose not to have a, a regularly scheduled summit at all, uh, partly uh, because of difficulty of mounting one uh, due to the pandemic, partly because he got embroiled in the U.S. presidential election campaign in the second half of the year. So this one is really long overdue. But I think the second reason is to confront the major problems that the G7 leaders will, there is simply no time to lose. So many people are dying every day now of COVID-19. The economic recovery is uh, uncertain in many countries and uh, not even yet begun in others. But above all, the evidence on climate change suggests that we're uh, either at or soon will be critical tipping points that may be the point of no return. So no time uh, to lose. These leaders uh, have to uh, make big, bold decisions on a broad range of critical subjects. Right, and what more, Professor Curtin, can you tell us about those critical subjects then? Well, never before has a G7 summit simultaneously had to confront so many major crises, uh, COVID, uh, the contraction of commerce uh, for trade dependent economies in particular, as Korea is, certainly um, climate change, the only really existential threat, and then conflict and competition with non-democratic countries uh, led by China, Russia, but other uh, dictatorships, uh, Myanmar uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, region, Mali of uh, late, uh, Belarus, uh, so many uh, others. And two of these big crises, um, COVID-19 and climate change, don't come from uh, one single bad actor uh, running a big country, uh, as in the old days uh, of the Cold War, uh, they come from uh, nature or from every one of us who uh, create climate change with every breath we take, step we make. So unbelievable um, complexity in actually finding the solutions and changing uh, the minds and the actions of people and other living things to get the problem solved. There is quite a lot to be discussed this time around, I suppose. Professor An, against this backdrop, this year is Korea's second invite. What are your thoughts on the consecutive invitations to the G7 summit and their implications? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good, it's a good point. And it's worth noting that Korea has been invited for two consecutive years. 
the first one by the, you know, the last year by the former president, you know, Trump. But it was, the meeting was canceled because the, due to the, uh, the pandemic situation in the United States. But this year by the UK Prime Minister. So, so I think that's great means that the global standing of Korea has been uh, significantly improved. That everybody wanted, right? That's that's good news. But downside, uh, you know, the other side is that I'm getting a little bit concerned about that the South Korean government have to deal with some tricky, very, you know, sensitive issues, you know, international issues. So related to China and you know, some limited issues. So because in the, we are kind of a, a politically, geopolitically quite closely related to the China, right? So that's kind of issues. Also the US, uh, UK perspective, I think that after Brexit, right, the UK need a strategic partner in Asia. So I guess they want to, you know, expand their the you know alliance in Asia. So also for the U US side also that because the you know, Donald Trump friend <laughs> former trader, that was kind of a and didn't really work well with the U European partners, right? So they now is a new president going to the first, you know, G7 meeting in Europe and have to, you know, resolve the issues with the European leaders, you know, in a peaceful way, you know, more amicably. So we'll see how they deal with, you know, the situations and, and they will impact on the Korean side as well. Right. Professor Curtin, what contributions do you envision Korea making to further the G7 commitment on issues of global health and climate change? Oh, well, I think there's several um, on the main issues and uh, the sessions uh, in which uh, the president of Korea will participate. Um, on COVID-19, uh, the main message from Korea, along with Japan, will don't get complacent. Korea and Japan thought they had from the beginning controlled the problem. Now they know they haven't. So uh, they do have to get ahead of the curve, which means uh, much more um, aggressive public health measures for a longer time, painful uh, though that uh, is, and uh, more international cooperation to share vaccines and produce more. On uh, commerce, uh, South Korea is um, the leading export dependent uh, economy. So the main message uh, will be, look, no protectionism in medical supplies, but on everything uh, else. And that includes uh, a reform of the uh, World Trade Organization and a support for the trade liberalization uh, regimes uh, that are there. Uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trade Pacific Partnership, uh, RESAP, uh, and maybe others uh, one could think. But I think the biggest uh, one is on um, climate change. The most obvious, uh, South Korea is uh, the home of the global environmental facility, and it's waiting uh, to receive and then disperse the $100 billion a year in climate finance for poor countries that G7 uh, countries, G21s, the rich part, had promised uh, to be giving by now, they haven't. Uh, so a big task for um, the uh, Cornwall summit uh, to do. But then, and here Korea might be on the defensive, um, stop coal financing. Uh, that's going to be a, a commitment uh, but stop using thermal coal at home. So uh, Korea, as with uh, other countries, Japan next door, really do face uh, a tough problem in making the clean energy transition uh, all of us need to do right away. Right. And Professor An, what do you propose with regard to the role that Korea could perhaps play within this forum? Yeah, I think that well, there are three sessions uh, President Moon Jae-in is you know, planning to join, but I think the most important critical issue to Korea, I guess, is the, the, the global health care system. And that is about the fair distribution of the you know, vaccine, also the manufacturing, speedy manufacturing of the you know, future vaccines. And, and consider the fact that there's many mutations you know, in the COVID vaccine. So, and then in some point, you need to coordinate the international level how to distribute it. For example, you know, crossing vaccination, inoculation stuff. So I think that that's the how we can do is like we can share the Korean government, we can share the, uh, our experience. Perhaps something, we have the comparative study, you know, how, what, when, where, 
well, when they go wrong and you find out something good, some guidelines to other countries. Also, try to be a you know, vaccine you know, hub in a way to uh, build on the, uh, some established international, uh, you know, some, you know, international center, become a center for the uh, vaccine distribution and fair distribution and manufacturing you know, and, you know, capability as well. Right. And, and speaking of vaccines, Professor Curtin, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has spoken of donating one billion COVID-19 vaccine doses to poorer nations under the framework of the G7. What are your prospects on this initiative? Well, I think what we'll certainly uh, see uh, all the leaders at Cornwall uh, do is say yes to Boris Johnson's uh, great uh, ideal announced a few days ago of having every person on the planet vaccinated by the end of next year. But that is uh, a big task, admirable though it is. So we'll have to see promises to answer the obvious question, how are they going to uh, do it? And the promise of uh, a billion new vaccines uh, for the poor countries in the world is a major step forward uh, but we need um, much more uh, right now. The most obvious one is to get the spare doses some countries in the G7 have out to the poor people who need them uh, right now. And uh, both the United States uh, and Britain uh, and Canada uh, as well will say we're at the point where we've uh, vaccinated 60, 63% of our people we're almost at herd immunity. We're getting millions of vaccines produced or pouring into the country right away. So we have ones to spare right now. And Joe Biden uh, has taken the lead in offering tens of millions right now. And they're already in the air landing in uh, Taiwan, for example. But uh, the United Kingdom and Canada are um, waiting. Uh, and it's not clear for what. Professor Curtin, aside from Korea, Australia, India and South Africa have also been invited to this year's G7 summit. Now, accordingly, pundits claim the G7 is seeking a wider alliance to offset China's influence. Do you agree? Uh, yes, but it's not just uh, China. Uh, it is uh, Russia, uh, which is um, very close to um, Japan and the Northern Territories and thus to Korea too, uh, does have a special relationship uh, with North Korea uh, and South Korea, again, on the uh, front line. What we do have to remember is that when the G7 was uh, created way back in 1975, it said at the end of uh, its first summit, Rambouillet, France, very clearly what its distinctive mission was to defend within its own countries but to promote globally the values of open democracy and human rights. So the D10, the Democratic 10, is not just some, well, watering down or extension of the essence of the uh, G7. It's a manifestation, a strengthening of the core for the world of today. So I do think uh, what we will see is the power, but the shared purpose of India, Korea, Australia, and South Africa are reinforcing the effectiveness of this um, G7, D10. And I suspect that the uh, formula uh, will stick. Uh, we'll be seeing a similar one uh, next year uh, when uh, Germany hosts the uh, G7 with its new government and I, I would guess a D10 too. Right. Meanwhile, Professor Anne, what strategy do you advise for Korea amid efforts uh, by the West, amid some of the efforts that is by the West to counter China's growing presence? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that the, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier today, that the greater re role comes with greater responsibilities because that if the Korean government tried to take a uh, really global leadership on any issues in global scale, you know, international issues, right? You need to take uh, some specific, you know, position on very sensitive issues such as the you know, Taiwan and the Strait. And as the professor Curtin is saying that, there actually I checked the uh, G7 uh, joint statement by the ministers, and they have they listed 20 
country-specific agenda, actually. So China is only one of them, actually. So there's North Korea and Russia. There's many countries there. So that the because of the you know geopolitical regions and proximity to the China issues is a big issue to and then the market in terms of the exporting market to China. And there's still we have to take a position. It's time for the South Korean government to take a position and then you know and move on. Because if you want to be a leader, you take a responsibility. That's the things how you handle it. So I guess that's the one if you how the South Korean government effectively uh, deal with the you know COVID the, you know international issues right effective way so that perhaps it show that leadership maybe can be a you know future member of the more expand, expanded g7 platform such as g10 or could be any you know, g2 or g10 or you know any any kind of format Right. And moving forward, Professor An, there is talk about a possible trilateral meeting among leaders mm -hmm. of Korea, Japan and the U.S. on the sidelines of the G7 summit. Do you suppose such a summit would perhaps serve to ease tensions in ties between Seoul and Tokyo? <laughs> Very interesting question. Uh yeah, I, I was wondering, asking myself, actually, very interesting point. Uh, my observation is the first one is that the near country uh, say they don't want to admit it, right? So they basically means that if the other side want to talk, we'll talk, basically, right? So it's like, you know, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden tried to be mediator between two countries. The problem was that, you know, in terms of the Korea and Japan relation, <laughs> it's third country is not going to play a big role actually, but uh, but I, I hopefully that since they have actually been there physically, so they I'm sure they have some time to encounter or kind of you know chat you know in the you know bathroom chat anything right. So I hope that they have some kind of communication. But the problem, concern is that you know the President Moon Jae-in's term is kind of not, it's only a one year left. So it's like the problem was that how we continue they, they improve the Korea and Japan relation will take a, lo a little bit longer to actually get it because they're new you know, new government next year. I think that's my issue. But still, I think that we should try, the Korean government try to keep trying to talking to them and try to some make a, any, make a sense in the future, future of the both countries. Right, to engage in dialogue, of yeah. course. Professor Curtin, what role should the G7 seek to take on post-pandemic? Well, there's several things uh, it uh, should do. Um, one is to uh, get ahead of the curve um, and uh, prepare in advance for the next pandemic, uh, be they the um, newer variants of uh, COVID or uh, other ones uh, from different sources that are sure to come. We just don't know uh, where or uh, when. It also needs to uh, look at uh, the other pandemics created by uh, COVID-19. Uh, one, of course, is um, mental health. Um, a problem before, much worse uh, when so many people were forced to be home alone, our young people couldn't go to um, school. And uh, then there's a broader structural component of the uh, mental health uh, problem, um, and that is dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, all the G7, uh, most of the D10 have aging populations. And that will be an extraordinary uh, increasing burden on our healthcare systems uh, and our social security uh, systems. And our countries all have rising deficits and uh, debt. So as Korea is um, number one uh, with uh, an aging population in the um, D10, it could certainly uh, use its influence to uh, inspire a G7 D10 um, initiative a research consortium to begin with, sharing best practices to solve these uh, real uh, medical and uh, social um, and economic burdens uh, that we will uh, face. And then I think another uh, challenge for the G7, G10 is to find a way, uh, as uh, was alluded to um, by uh, my colleague, uh, for Japan, and Korea to come together uh, to put aside um, the tragedies of um, the past three quarters of a century ago, the really minor uh, territorial disputes of today and say, look, with China on our border, uh, Russia too, we need to come together and show those countries that we are unified. So if, for example, uh, South Korea is invaded uh, yet again, memories of uh, 1950 still imminent. Japan will not just stand idly by and uh, watch. 
it will uh, be there and it should um, Japan be attacked, some of its territories, or um, polities of concern, Taiwan, that the United States can count on both of its major allies in the theater working together uh, seamlessly uh, the way that uh, many of its other allies uh, do in uh, NATO on the um, European and much broader uh, front. Right. And Professor Ahn, keeping in mind what Professor Curtin has just said, what lies ahead for Korea then as it seeks to further perhaps expand its presence in the global arena? Yeah, two things like share the best practice of the you know COVID-19 vaccine measures with other countries, and number two is to coordinate vaccine production, global production and distribution in the in the future, in the in the near future. I think there's two things uh, the Korean government have to show their leadership on two aspects. I see. All right, Professor An, thank you very much for your yeah, thoughts. Thank you. Professor Curtin, over in the U.S., uh, over in Canada, that is. Thank you very much for your time and for your thoughts. Great to be with you. Right then, in line with efforts to better contain COVID-19, authorities here have extended the country's social distancing guidelines for three more weeks, so do seek to abide by these measures. Have a safe weekend.